Yeah, I wrote another article in the Public Health Alert last summer called The Lyme Disease Epidemic, CDC Tuskegee Experiment Phase 2. And in that article, I say that America's most egregious example of medical malpractice through treatment denial is now an everyday reality conducted on a grand scale and run with the complicity of the CDC. And I have referred to this as the institutionalization of the Tuskegee Experiment, which it is. So, uh, how closely are Tuskegee and Lyme related? Well, as I said before, um, both are caused by spirochetes. They have similar infectious phases, and the Lyme disease infection is actually more complex and deadly than syphilis. So this is from Wikipedia, just showing you the uh, relationship of uh, the spirochete, the Borrelia spirochete, which causes Lyme disease. Uh, it's actually very closely related to the uh, Treponema spirochete that causes syphilis. Here, um, the Borrelia of the relapsing fever family are very similar to the Borrelia, which causes Lyme disease. One of these treatments was uh, vaccines and so-called pyrotherapy, and uh, this was done through the injections of other types of spirochetes, including Borrelia spirochetes. They were searching for common antigens between syphilis and uh, Borrelia, so that if they could inject somebody with a less pathological spirochete, it could cause or elicit an immune response that could have a potential vaccine for syphilis. So there is also a precedent for injecting people with these Borrelia spirochetes, such as the relapsing fever. Spirochetes. Uh, I ask, is this part of the Tuskegee experiment and is it still going on? <laughs> this is an article by Alan Barber, who's a uh, very high placed figure within the uh, Lyme research community. He wrote an article which, which he described uh, the use of these Borrelia um, for pyrotherapy. What they were trying to do was induce a fever, and hopefully the fever would uh, help people who had syphilis uh, get rid of the infection. But he describes uh, this experiment where they were passaging Borrelia uh, no more than 30 to 40 times in mice uh, before the inoculation of the strain back into humans. So you wonder what's going on here. Uh, I did some research and I found as far back as 1921, uh, they were injecting soldiers with picks that had these relapsing fever Borrelia in them. This was done in Panama. They had three ways of inducing the infection. One was caused by uh, injecting infected ticks into rats, and then they took uh, the blood from these white rats and injected the, the volunteer patients with it, and then monitored the infection. They also directly bypassed the middleman and injected the, uh, the disease ticks directly into volunteer one case took the blood from the infected rats and injected the patients, and in another case, they directly injected the ticks into the subject. And in the final case, they just allowed the ticks to naturally feed on the volunteer patients and monitor the infection. So again, these uh, Borrelia spirochetes are of basic biological interest. Uh, again, Alan Barber said that the antigenic variation of the relapsing fever was the useful model for studying the immune system, and they are actually using these in vaccines nowadays. He also stated that the uh, antigenic variation uh, by these, exhibited by these 
collapsing keeper Borrelia is of basic biological interest. So there's a lot of uh, motivation to study these types of spirochetes. So obviously, if spirochetes uh, are that useful, there's uh, going to be a good reason for them to start to experiment with them. So I asked, did Tuskegee really end? I don't think it did. I think it went operational. This is a little chart I drew up just to try to explain what I think is going on with the uh, summary of the Tuskegee experiment then and now. In the original experiment, uh, they took spirochete victims who were poor and uneducated and geographically isolated. They kept them from seeing doctors outside of their little experimental system. Um, in Tuskegee phase two, which is the Lyme disease case, um, again, spirochete victims are prevented from getting treatment from doctors outside the system. Uh, the doctors are effectively eliminated if they try to treat patients outside of the treatment guidelines. And this is now an unlimited geographical area by comparison. With Tuskegee 1, the chronic disease was mislabeled. Uh, it's called bad blood so that the victim would understand they had syphilis. And in uh, the Lyme disease case, they call it post-Lyme syndrome. It's another way of labeling the disease so that patients can't get treatment. And in the original phase, uh, it was a contrived epidemic which killed some of the victims, and it's doing the same thing in phase two. In phase one, of course, the researchers monitored the effects of the untreated syphilis, and they did the same thing, and they're doing the same thing with uh, the Lyme disease phase, so that they could develop vaccines and market the vaccine. The first phase was overseen by the U.S. Public Health Service and the CDC in cooperation with the AMA, and the current phase is being overseen by the uh, U.S. Public Health Service service and the CDC and the EIS in conjunction with the IDSA. And again, they're using the national security justification to do it. So the first phase was done under a national health pretext. The CDC and the public health service were involved. This phase involves the national security pretext and involves the CDC and its EIS branch. Okay, so now, how much time I have? I'm gonna connect the dots as per the title of uh, this talk. I'm just going to give a quick overview uh, before I start the chart here. So there are actually a staggering number of connections between the Lyme disease epidemic and the bioworker establishment. That's why they're allowed to, uh, to get away with what they're doing. Okay, the location of the outbreak was named for a town just outside of the biowarfare lab in Lyme, Connecticut. The illness it produces has the effects sought by numerous government uh, testing programs, such as the MK Ultra program I showed you earlier. And the properties of the disease, disease agent are uh, ideal for a uh, debilitating biowarfare agent. It's very complex. It's very pervasive in your body. It can affect uh, all your major organs. It's relapsing, so it's difficult to cure with antibiotics. And it has a self-protecting mechanism, which is a cyst formation. So it curls up into a little, little cyst, which is uh, <coughs> relatively impervious to antibiotics. So the manner in which patients are being, being deliberately un un uh, left untreated and the manner in which the doctors are being put out of business for trying to treat them is also consistent with there being a biowarfare experiment being run. Um, I believe these many biowarfare connections are actually highly explanatory. And it involves developing vaccines and running vaccine trials because the same experts that have institutionalized the treatment denial have actually run the vaccine trials. And this is also consistent with the CDC blueprint publication, um, which I'll show you later on how to make uh, the diagnosis and treatment of Lyme disease difficult because it makes a you know, Lyme disease vaccine more marketable. I believe this is the smoking gun of what's going on with the so-called steer camp of Lyme disease. Basically, they want to make the vaccine look inexpensive and less dangerous by comparison to the actual epidemic. Okay, so I'm going to draw a chart here just showing various, various connections to the Lyme disease and bio. Um, the disease is named after a town in like Connecticut, which is 20 miles across the Long Island Sound from the Biowarfare Lab, which is Plum Island Animal Disease Center. Has anybody here ever heard of that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> um, again, they did outdoor tick experiments there, and uh, they have a history of leaks, which I'm going to get into. So again, the namesake for the disease is Plum Connecticut, which is just outside of the Biowarfare Lab. Okay, so the namesake for the actual organism, the disease organism, Borrelia burgdorferi, is named after Willie Burgdorfer, 
who was a biowarfare researcher and later on a military epidemiologist. He worked at the Rocky Mountain Labs, which is a biowarfare lab that developed vaccines for the military. Uh, Berndorfer did indoor tick experiments there where he invented, uh, exited ticks with various Borrelia type agents. Um, exited ticks are the type that spread Lyme disease, which is caused by a Borrelia agent. So again, the disease organism namesake was a biowarfare researcher. This is Willie Bergdorfer at his uh, lab bench infecting ticks. I'm going to show you some pictures of that later on. Okay, so the first person to culture the disease organism was Alan Barber, who was a CDC EIS biowarfare defense agent. He was a biowarfare researcher and he worked with Willie Bergdorfer at the Rocky Mountain Lab. Uh, Alan Barber was the first person to culture the uh, Lyme disease organism. It's a very difficult organism in the culture, which is part of the reason why it's easy to deny that people have the infection. Um, he developed the so-called BSK medium. I think it's called Barber Stoner Kelly medium. Uh, but the B in the BSK medium is for Barber. Alan Barber actually directs a biowarfare lab now at the University of California, Irvine. And the actual disease vector that spreads Lyme disease was isolated uh, by Alan Steer, who is also an EIS biowarfare defense agent. So he works for the D CDC. He also worked for a defense contractor that worked uh, with Plum Island, that was Yale Corporation. Uh, of course, Alan Steer is the namesake for the so-called Steer Camp of Lyme disease, which has created an extremely hostile climate to the administration of antibiotics. Um, it's also conducive to vaccine studies, and he actually led the vaccine study for his employer's uh, first licensee. Yale actually developed and licensed the first Lyme disease vaccine. Okay, the disease treatment has been discredited through something called the uh, Klempner study, which is, uh, Mark Klempner was one of the authors of this study, which uh, supposedly found out that long-term antibiotics did not have the any beneficial effect over the short term antibiotics. Uh, Klempner is also an EIS biowarfare defense agent. He also directs a biowarfare lab at Boston University. He's also a New England Journal of Medicine edi editor. So his fraudulent study basically justified the uh, steer camp of Lyme disease and it's still being used to that to do that today. Okay so finally the uh, steer camp philosophy of treatment denial has been institutionalized in the uh, infamous IDSA treatment guidelines. The lead author is Gary Wormser, who is a biowarfare defense expert. He lectures nationally on uh, various biowarfare pathogens and how to treat them. If I have time, I'll get into that later on. Um, but basically, he's codified the treatment denial that the Klempner study justified. And this is all basically an institutionalization of the original steer camp. Uh, treatment denial philosophy. So, look at the top half of this. I tried to think of a way that would explain uh, how bioorder surrounds all aspects of Lyme disease. This is the uh, organizations and people associated with the actual disease agent. And if you look at the bottom, these uh, are people that are associated with disease treatment denial. Uh, so quickly, now that I have this chart up, just to show you who the uh, IDSA treatment guideline authors are on this chart. It's the bottom three, which is Gary Wormser, Mark Klempner, and Alan Steer. These are the infamous IDSA treatment guidelines. Uh, Wormser, Steer, and Klempner are on them. And they were investigated by the Attorney General a couple of years ago, found that they had serious questions about the recommendations reflected, uh, didn't include all relevant science because they were largely according their own studies. And just last week, three congressmen have come out and asked that um, the IDSA revise their guidelines. They refused to do it. Uh, this is a chart I drew up showing that Gary Wormser, who's the lead author of the IDSA treatment guidelines, is also the lead author, the only author in this particular article on bioterrorism. So it's kind of odd that the lead author for treatment guidelines for disease, which is widely recognized as being bioworfer biowarfare pathogen, is actually uh, writing articles on bioterrorism, how to treat it. So uh, this is also on the internet, by the way. I so say, what's wrong with this picture? Uh, in one case, Worms are, is writing articles about knowing the biowarfare agents and preventing the terror. So I've subtitled the IDSA guidelines as denying the agent and preventing the treatment, because that's what he's doing, in effect. Okay, so the same chart, you have actually two 
fire warfare lab directors. It was pretty impressive. And these are the biowarfare epidemiologists that are involved in the Lyme epidemic. So is this a recipe to, for disaster to have all these biowarfare researchers in charge of treating uh, the public health menace? I would say that it is um, for one reason. Just the vaccine efforts alone. Alan Steer led the very first uh, commercial Lyme vaccine. As I mentioned before, this ended in a hail of lawsuits. It's a public health disaster. Alan Barber was just awarded with a uh, live vaccine contract uh, a few months ago, and he's actually going to be using live attenuated uh, Borrelia strains. So, interesting to see if any lawsuits develop out of that. So, just to summarize the IDSA treatment guidelines, over 20% of the authors of biowarfare researchers and Gary Wormser led a disastrous vaccine effort. He's also a uh, biowarfare researcher, lecturer, Alan Steer also led vaccine trials and is an EIS CDC biowarfare expert. And Mark Klempner, whose research has undergirded the whole fraudulent uh, philosophy that long-term antibiotics don't do any better than short-term in the treatment of Lyme disease. In his long-term study, he actually didn't even bother to administer long-term antibiotics. They, they uh, ended the study before he could even administer them because they decided in advance they weren't going to do any good. summary, uh, we have what I call biowarfare through treatment guidelines, and it's preventing effective treatment of the underlying infection by only allowing short-term antibiotics, and they are allowed to monitor their immune response by doing this throughout the disease progression, just like they did in Tuskegee. And Alan Steer actually published several articles on how this uh, allowed them to develop the vaccine for his parent corporation, and uh, they can develop and test vaccines under the national security immunity. So I've talked a lot about uh, guidelines. I just want to give a quick overview. There's, guidelines are really becoming a predominant, and they're starting to get more scrutiny. Finally, um, this is an article busting the myths about guidelines. One of the myths is that there is no such thing as a bad clinical practice guideline. guideline. Well, certainly there are. Uh, this is an article that came out just last year, which shows that guide, treatment guidelines can actually be fatal. That's a communal pneumonia, and they actually found that the doctors who followed and treated it within the guidelines had an increased mortality risk for their patients. So there's also uh, new evidence that the evidence undergirding many of these guidelines is extremely flimsy. This is in the Archives of Internal Medicine uh, analysis of the overall level of evidence behind the IDSA guidelines. Now, IDSA are the ones that are controlling the treatment of the Lyme disease uh, epidemic. They found that more than half of the current recommendations of the IDSA are based on level three evidence only, which is a pain. So again, this is a disaster. Uh, if treatment guidelines have been documented as deadly, which they have been, and if treatment guidelines are based largely on opinion, does that mean opinions can kill? Obviously it does. Um, this is a quote by Marsha Engel, who was uh, a New England Journal of Medicine editor for two decades. She says, in recent years, drug companies have perfected a new and highly effective method to expand their markets. Instead of promoting drugs to treat their diseases, they have begun to promote diseases to fit their drugs. And I think that's what they're doing with respect to Lyme disease as well. And treatment guidelines are an excellent way to do that.